My name is Rachel Kane, and I'm a New York attorney who left a global law firm to work on solutions for women's rights. And I am deeply troubled by the indictment brought against Rachel Trowitz and Nicole Dedon. The forced labor statute has been weaponized as a way to persecute anyone who the government views as distasteful, which is an insult to true victims of forced labor. Its vagueness is impossible to defend, which means the consequences of it on the US legal system could be dire. This is a short presentation about the indictment in the hopes that it will help you understand for yourself or your organization the implications of applying the forced labor statute in the way that it's been applied against Rachel Chowitz and Nicole Data. So the law that we're talking about is 18 U.S. Code 1589, forced labor. And the code says, whoever knowingly provides or obtains the labor or services of a person by means of threats of force, serious harm, abuse or threatened abuse of the law, or a scheme plan pattern intended to cause the person to believe that if they did not perform such labor, that person or another person would suffer serious harm. So when discussing this indictment, many people have difficulty relating to the defendants because the practice that they taught orgasmic meditation is not something that is in their regular wheelhouse. Orgasmic meditation is a 15 minute partnered practice where one person strokes the clitoris of their partner in a timed protocol manner for 15 minutes, where climax is not the goal. The practice of orgasmic meditation has been independently researched by qualified research scientists, and it shows promising results in addressing a variety of mental health issues such as trauma and depression, in many ways similar to new scientific findings around the effects of psychedelic medicines. All that being said, the sexual nature of this content can give rise to skepticism all the way to disgust, but that's not the point of this presentation. The actual allegations in the indictment are not based on the sexual component of the practice taught by Rachel Chowitz and Nicole Daydone, which means that this type of indictment could be applied to any individual business or nonprofit. So what's the impact of this indictment? Although ostensibly rooted in the prohibition of slavery, the wording of the federal forced labor statute is very broad, and notions of psychological coercion are highly subjective and are gaining social currency, taking on novel meanings that would not have been anticipated even a few years ago. All of that means that the statute can and is being applied far beyond the traditional remit of subjecting often undocumented workers to appalling physical violence threats to their family, and threats of legal processes. So no matter how unfounded someone's claims are, for a motivated critic of an organization who gets the ear of the media and prosecutors, this kind of indictment could circumvent both civilly and criminally at a state and federal level protections that would otherwise shield an organization from liability. If this case goes ahead, leadership of all kinds of organizations will become vulnerable to prosecution under this statute, even if people's involvement in their organizations is objectively observable as voluntary, if there's an organizational ethical oversight committee, if there are come and go as you please policies with no history of retributive practices for individuals who leave the organization, and even if there's credible scientific evidence that underlies the practices or products being propounded by those organizations. Because One Taste, the company that Nicole Daydon co-founded and Rachel Truitt's worked at, had all of these elements. Key elements in this indictment are the allegations that, one, the defendants recruited vulnerable people. Two, the defendants collected sensitive information from this class of people. Three, the defendants exercised coercive practices such as abusive employment practices, indoctrination, and directing sexual activity, all for the purposes of obtaining labor and services. Key elements you would have assumed were in a forced labor indictment, but are missing in this indictment, are threats of physical force or restraint, immigration issues, underage participants, and threats of legal process. 
Also conspicuously missing from this indictment are any victims. There have been no named victims, not even Doe victims identified only to counsel for the defendants. In the forced labor code, serious harm is defined as any harm, whether physical or non-physical, including psychological, financial, or reputational harm, that's sufficiently serious under all surrounding circumstances to compel a reasonable person of the same background and same circumstances to perform or to continue to perform labor or services in order to avoid incurring that harm. This means that a forced labor indictment is victim dependent. There is no way to prepare a defense without knowing who the victim is or are because each person's particular background and circumstances is essential to determining if a reasonable person in the same position would consider the alleged harm serious. However, in this indictment, the government has specifically said that because this is a conspiracy, rather than having charged the sub substantive offense, the indictment does not need to have or name any victims. In fact, the government has said that the victims of the conspiracy are among over 35,000 customers employees that the company has had over 12 years of operation, which presents an incredible catch-22 for the defendants because their hands are effectively tied from defending themselves against their unknown accusers. The foundation of this indictment is this concept of the defendants having intentionally recruited a vulnerable class of people to exploit. This is particularly difficult for the defendants because an independent financial review of the company One Taste showed that One Taste did not spend any money on marketing or advertising. Most customers found One Taste through word of mouth referrals. Over a dozen reporters attended One Taste workshops and community events over a six year period. And during that time, no article ever presented One Taste as holding itself out as a place for healing trauma. What is particularly troubling is that many well-meaning organizations do intend to help specifically people who come from vulnerable classes, be they people with trauma or people with medical conditions. And an indictment such as this one could mean that those organizations are accused of intentionally targeting a vulnerable class of people to exploit. The indictment then goes on to say that the purpose of targeting this vulnerable class of people was to subject them to abusive employment practices. This is being applied to an organization, One Taste, whose compensation structure changed dramatically over time as revenues grew up to over 300% as the business model changed. People were paid what they were promised. And by virtue of this being a mission-driven rather than a compensation-driven organization, staff sometimes went above and beyond what their jobs required. This is really problematic because this could be applied to organizations where people are aware of the long hours required for a job before they become employed. And this takes employment disputes outside the realm of state law and criminalizes practices that could potentially be labeled as abusive and therefore forced labor. For long-standing religious traditions, such as missionaries, who travel to new locations or support existing centers, these kinds of um, practices could be labeled as abusive employment practices. The next alleged coercion tactic the indictment presents is indoctrination. This is being applied to an agnostic philosophy that had no creation story or gods and was more akin to a philosophy for living a healthy or purposeful flourishing life. There are no vows, pledges, property, commitments, mandatory tithing, or threats of eternal damnation if someone didn't adopt the philosophy. And many people came to it just for the practice of orgasmic meditation, just like many people do yoga without adopting Vedic spirituality. What it could be applied to is many mission-driven organizations that are coalesced around a set of values and beliefs ranging from a written religious system to a shared set of values or operating principles. Under this indictment, indoctrination would apply to the set of practices or teachings conveyed or shared to any staff, customer, or stakeholder in any such mission-driven organization. For example, in 2023, there was a civil case of forced labor brought against the largest Hindu temple in the Western Hemisphere. A spokesperson for the temple said that the workers came to the United States as volunteers, not as employees, and that volunteerism was a core part of their faith tradition. The indictment then alleges 
that the defendants directed sexual activity of the customers and employees of the company. And this was one of the kinds of abuse that they subjected those people to. This is being applied to an organization that had an experiential attitude towards sex. People who asked questions about sex were given suggestions, but the suggestions were always optional and had no consequences. It would just be like if you went to a yoga ashram, you would expect people to suggest that you do yoga or suggest how to improve your yoga, but there were no consequences for not participating. But because of the breadth of this indictment, this could now be applied to individuals in leadership positions who have consensual sexual relationships with people who are either closely or loosely affiliated with their organizations. For example, one 2023 survey found that 60% of people had had an in-office romance and 43% of those had resulted in a marriage. Non-consensual sexual relationships are, of course, extensively addressed by criminal and civil statutes, but this kind of indictment transforms individuals' sexual relationships and turns them into the basis of a potential forced labor charge. Why this should matter to you and your organization. The components of the alleged conspiracy could easily be applied to common and traditional practices of community building where there are frequently overlapping volunteer and employee statuses, um, exposing those organizations and their executives to a similar prosecution. The idea of intentionally recruiting a vulnerable class of individuals who had suffered a prior trauma is very vague and broad considering many people, both working at a company and, and customers of a company may have experienced trauma and provides a dangerously expansive consideration of what actions may therefore be considered coercive. Three, in many environments, people ask for and are offered suggestions, but in the case of this indictment, the reliance on people's subjective beliefs as to whether something was coercive or not makes this indictment dangerously broad and invasive. Finally, the structure and content of the indictment opens the way for former participants, both customers and employees, to call activities they consented to in an organization at the time a crime in retrospect. As a woman who has experienced sexual assault, the practice of orgasmic meditation not only changed my life, I realized it could be a modality that will help to end sexual violence. This indictment represents a threat to innocent individuals and companies and should be stopped.